I'm going to start to illustrate that scripture Pastor John just read by asking you a question. Um, and the question is, what do you think is the most trusted name in Columbus, Indiana? I don't need an answer, just need to think about it. What name do you think is the most trusted name in Columbus, Indiana? You might be thinking something like Cummins Diesel Company. You might be thinking something like St. Peter's Lutheran School uh, or any other ideas that pop into your mind, but I'm going to suggest that uh, I'm pretty sure that the most trusted name in Columbus, Indiana is Jesus, Jesus Christ. Now, I know that there's a lot of people here that do not believe in Jesus, don't love him, don't trust him, don't follow him, uh, don't believe in him at all. But I'm going to suggest and imagine that uh, the most trusted name here is Jesus Christ. And 20 years ago, in the year 2004, uh, the, something happened that proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ in an extra powerful way back in 2004. And that was the release of the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And so when that movie came out, it was a huge, huge hit, not only at the box office. It was a major success at the box office, but it was an even bigger success for the kingdom of God. And it was a huge success despite the fact that as they were trying to release and advertise the upcoming release of that movie, there was a tremendous protest and a huge uh, objection and even a boycott against that movie. But it was not the name of Christ that the boycott and the protest was about. It was about the name of the man who produced and directed and funded that movie, Mel Gibson. And so Mel Gibson, a lot of people were saying back then, was a horrible person. They said he was so horrible that uh, they said here that he was a liar and a womanizer and that he hurt and abused and betrayed so many people that he cannot be trusted with anything, much less the name of Christ. So, you know, Gibson was interviewed about all those allegations and the protest and the boycott. And Mel Gibson's answer to that was, he said, all of these allegations against me are true. And he said, I have been a complete jerk. But he said, I have had an encounter with God. And God has changed me. And I'm no longer the same person because I am forgiven. And I mentioned all that today because we're going to be talking a lot about Jacob. We're going to be talking a lot about the him, despite the fact, and, and the weird fact is, is that he, Jacob, becomes one of the most uh, important and critically famous people in the entire Bible, uh, despite the fact that Jacob, for most of his life, was a complete and total jerk. And so it's uh, true that a lot of people back then were saying the same type of thing, you know, is, is there any worse person that can possibly represent the name of God than Jacob? And so, uh, the, as the scripture unfolded that we are reading about, Jacob had some encounters with God that changed Jacob. And in the encounter with God, Jacob was asked a question by God. The question that God asked Jacob is, what is your name? Because the name Jacob 
in uh, Hebrew means deceiver and cheater, someone that you cannot trust. So God asked him that, what is your name? And then God changed Jacob's name. Jacob was forgiven, not by any amount of gifts that he gave, but he was forgiven because of God's grace. Jacob was forgiven and he was enabled to change. And so he was given the new name, Israel. Israel means struggled with God. So in our Genesis sermon series, we have reached the point to where we're now now talking about Jacob and Esau. And so when we see the illustration that we have uh, on your program, on your service folder, and up here, we see the illustration of Jacob and Esau, which is actually an illustration of a bowl of stew, a bowl of stew, which actually gives us a very telling backstory to the scriptures that we just read. And so the backstory is that Jacob uh, was indeed a jerk. He was a complete jerk. And Esau was actually a complete goofball. And so these two brothers were a mess and they were nothing but trouble uh, their whole lives almost. And then so in any event, throughout the book of Genesis, We have been on this Genesis sermon series for a while, and it has been fascinating. And uh, throughout the book of Genesis, we are seeing mankind struggle deeper and deeper into sin. Three weeks ago, Pastor Adam explained for us the Tower of Babel, and he explained that the people at that time were struggling to trust God. They were struggling to trust the use of His name the use of his name. Rather, Pastor Adam explained, they wanted to make a name for themselves instead. Two weeks ago, Pastor John explained for us about Abraham and Sarah. And Sarah was struggling to trust God because of having no children. Last week, Pastor Adam explained for us how Abraham uh, and Isaac were struggling to trust God because Isaac was a target of sacrifice. And now this week, Isaac's two sons, Jacob and Esau, are struggling to trust God with anything. And so here we have generation after generation after generation with the same sin problem, struggling to trust God. And Jacob and Esau's struggle starts and begins with a bowl of stew. And so as this telling backstory goes, Uh, Esau, uh, the Word of God says, just before the Scripture that we heard read this morning, Esau comes in from a hard day's work in the field, and he smells the wonderful aroma of the stew that Jacob is cooking, and so he asks Jacob for some of the stew, and he says that I'm starving. Now, Jacob could have very easily said, "Uh, absolutely, brother, you sit down and let me serve you and enjoy some of this stew. Let's do it. But instead, Jacob does the opposite, Uh, and so he manipulates his brother. He, 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 He victimizes his in a moment of weakness that Esau is in because he's starving to death, and he says, I will give you some of this stew only if you sell me your birthright. And as bad as that is, it's just about worse that Esau is such a goofball that he he does it. He sells his birthright. He sells his God-given relationship inheritance for a bowl of stew. And so, you know, uh, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking of Jacob must have been a good cook. I mean, that stew must have been some kind of stew. You know, and so I got to thinking about that, and I'm thinking, seriously? You know, I mean, I, I like food. I like food a lot. And I really, you know, I like uh, biscuits and gravy from Rody's. I like it a lot, but not that much. And so, you know, my little wifey, she makes, uh, you know, uh, pork uh, loin with, uh, with pineapple au gratin, and oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. Uh, love it, love it, love it. But 
thanks be to God, I don't love any food more than I love God, more than I love my relationship with him. And that's by his grace alone. So Esau did this. And Esau is a complete fool, a complete fool and a goofball. But despite that, he is completely victimized by his brother. His brother's lying, is cheating, and is stealing. Uh, And so Esau has every right to be angry at Jacob. He's got every right to distrust him and to even have a heart of vengeance against him for victimizing him twice so seriously because Jacob does the same thing again with a bowl of stew, lying and deceiving his own father uh, to uh, get his father's blessing, whom his father thought he was blessing Esau, but he was blessing Jacob. And so uh, twice, twice Esau was victimized by this lying, cheating brother. And now, this is where our reading picks up, which uh, we just heard from Pastor John. And so, when Pastor John starts reading, we hear the story about how Jacob is trying to return home. He's trying to return home back to the land of Abraham and Isaac. But Esau was there. Esau is still living there. Not only is he still living there, but Esau still has uh, an intense anger and hate for him and an intense desire to kill Jacob. And so, what we see is for the first time, Jacob does something right. Jacob actually does something good and right for the first time, and that is he decides to pray. He decides to pray to God, and Jacob tries to take a shot at doing something new and risky in his imagination. He he starts thinking about trusting God more than trusting himself. And so this idea of praying to God and trusting God turns out to result in a gut-wrenching wrestling match with God all night long. So this man that Jacob ends up wrestling all night, the Scripture ends up explaining to us, is a pre-incarnate Christ. Right in the middle of his prayer, his prayer is being answered, and he starts wrestling with Christ and wrestles all night long. So that makes me ask another question. And that is, how many of you have ever faced a crisis or a problem that's so disturbing that it's kept you up all night long wrestling with God? I have. And I know that many of you have done the same thing too. And so at this point, some of you might be relating to what Scripture is telling us. You might be relating to Jacob. You might have some Jacob in you. You might be relating to Esau. You might have some of Esau with you. Um, I'm actually glad my little wife is not at this service because she might be pointing at me right now, (laughs) knowing that I've got a lot of both of those in me. And you might also. So if you have, and if you identify with this, I'm going to say, be at peace. Because God is going to give us hope, and He's going to give you and I some great encouragement about our deeply entrenched bad habits that can keep us from being who God wants us to be. And so because of those deeply entrenched bad habits, God wants to wrestle with you. And so God is actually going to invite you to wrestle with Him this morning. Because deep encounters with Christ are exactly God's recipe for changing your heart and changing my heart and allowing our hearts to grow until, just like Jacob and just like Mel Gibson, we change and we grow and we are transformed and we become different and we become better people. We become people that are capable of giving the grace and giving the forgiveness that we have been given for free, not because of how many gifts we gave, but we become capable of something that we were not capable of before. And that's because it's a result of wrestling with God in prayer. And God gives us those capabilities as a free gift 
of grace. And so God gives us that encouragement and that hope this morning through the words of Jesus himself. And so we're going to hear the words of Jesus himself right now. And so as you listen to these words, I want you to hear his words, but I also want you to hear an invitation to wrestle with him, an invitation to help him to make your heart a little more like his heart. So Jesus says, happy are those who are humble. They will receive what God has promised. Jacob never humbled himself, ever. Life was all about him, no matter who he betrayed or hurt. <clears throat> Jacob didn't care, but he was changed. He was forgiven by God, but now is he going to be forgiven by Esau? He does not know. Esau, though he was the victim, he had to realize his own sinfulness and take his eyes off of his brother's sinfulness, which allowed him to elevate his righteousness above his brother's. So he had to be humble. Jesus says, happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. In order to do what God requires, Jacob had to face God and he had to face the one that he betrayed and hurt so badly. In order to do what God requires, Esau had to face God, and he had to face Jacob and relinquish his right. Esau had to relinquish his right to rule over the one who hurt him. Jesus said, happy are those who are merciful to others God will be merciful to them. Jacob started all this by showing no mercy, zero, and by continuing to have no mercy throughout his life until, until he needed mercy. And that's when that struggle and wrestling match began. <clears throat> Esau needed to release Jacob. He needed to release Jacob and give him the grace that Jacob in no way deserved. Now, you and I can accidentally become smugly comfortable about the righteous anger that we have in a grudge towards someone. And many times it's totally righteous. Jesus said, happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Jacob needed a new heart. That put him under God. He needed a new heart that put him under his brother Esau, and God gave him that new heart during that wrestling match, during that Israel moment. Esau needed a new heart. He needed to see past Jacob's guilty heart before his own heart could be healed, and God allowed that. God gave Esau a new heart that could do what he couldn't do before, release him and relinquish his right. Jesus said, happy are those who work for peace. God will call them his children. Jacob's heart was indeed enabled by God to achieve reconciliation. But despite the forgiveness and reconciliation that Jacob was allowed and enabled by God to do, God did not allow Jacob to live in the same place as Esau. And Esau's heart was changed. Esau, working for peace also, he was enabled by God to forgive Jacob. But God protected Esau from being a further victim of Jacob by not allowing Jacob to continue to live in that land with Esau. So that being said, with those stipulations put there by God on this particular reconciliation, uh, Pastor John and Pastor Adam and I, we want to <clears throat> just tell you that if any of you have some deep wounds and scars on your heart from being victimized by some Jacob in your life, we're sorry. We're very, very sorry. And we need what God is offering us here. We need to somehow reach this point 
It might take struggling with God all night, but we need to somehow reach this point of forgiveness and reconciliation. But just like God warned uh, and did not allow complete reconciliation because it might not have been safe, we here at St. Peter's, we have LifeWorks Ministry. And I'm encouraging any of you that are deeply wounded and are faced with this dilemma right now to please go visit LifeWorks Ministry right here on our campus. A huge blessing that we have here uh, because we need to be able to forgive. We need to be able to be reconciled. But LifeWorks can help you and I learn how to do that in a safe way. That being said, we need our Israel moments. We need our Israel moments that change us. We need to connect with God so that He can change our hearts. Walking in our baptism is an ongoing journey of many Israel moments. And through those, we grow to be more and more like Christ and less like ourselves, more capable of reconciliation and forgiveness that we were not capable of before the most recent Israel moment in our life. Now, God asked Jacob a very personal and deeply life-changing question, and he's asking you and I that question this morning. He asked, what is your name? <laughs> 